All right, we're in a series called In God We Trust. And you just heard a part of our text, which is in Proverbs chapter three. And if you will turn there, we're gonna review. If you weren't here last week, I can't review everything, but I encourage you to go back on the archive on our website and watch last week's message. It'll be a blessing to you. You might even laugh a little bit. All right, Proverbs chapter three, we're talking, I was thinking about naming this uh, message today, the benefits of trusting God, but I ended up calling it trust issues. You ever had trust issues? You ever known anybody that had trust issues? Are you sitting next to somebody that has trust issues? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm looking up some dad jokes because I can tell it's a tough crowd this morning. I'm gonna have to, have to loosen y'all up. Here's a fun fact. Australia's biggest export, it's boomerangs. Did you know that? It's also their biggest import, so. (laughs) All right. Proverbs chapter three, verse five, it says, trust in the Lord. Now, we said that word trust in Hebrew means to hurriedly, confidently run into for safekeeping and, and shelter. So that's the Hebrew meaning. Trust in the Lord with how much of your heart? All of it. All of it. Not half. Don't be half hearted. All of it. And lean not to your own understanding. We said that if you lean, you know, you're relying upon something for support. And the scripture says don't rely upon your own understanding for strength or support. That's easier for some of us than others. And then it says in all of your ways, in everything that you do, your hobbies, your lifestyle, um, your activities, your school, your job, If you're a salesperson or if you're a mechanic, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Constantly looking to him for help. Anybody need help? Help me. Help me, Rhonda. Help me, Jesus. Help me, somebody. Lean not to your own understanding. Do I sound really loud to y'all? Am I okay? Okay. All right. I might point these monitors at myself because if I hear myself, I won't yell at you. (laughs) There we go. Sorry about that. So lean not to your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he in return shall direct your path. Make it smooth and make it straight. How many of you tired of bumpy crooked paths? You wanna, I want a smooth straight path and one translation says he will make your path obvious. You know what's worse than a bumpy a crooked path is not being able to find it. It's like, oh, snap, where am I supposed to go? I don't see the road, a path, the path. You know, it, it, it rains cats and dogs, as they say here in Mobile, Alabama, quite often. And you ever been headed down the interstate and it's raining so hard, everybody just stops? That's when it's really raining hard. You know, it's never rained that hard on me. I keep going. I'm like, oh, everybody's stopping. I can get ahead of them. All right, don't lean on you. He'll direct, make smooth, straight, and obvious your path. When you don't know, don't know which way to go, he'll, he'll lead you and direct you. I heard a preacher making fun of other preachers hearing from God. And I thought, that poor guy. How many know you can't have what you make fun of, right? <laughs> okay, anyway. Now, I understand he was referring to, you know, hearing the audible voice of God. If somebody hears the audible voice of God all the time, they might need a jacket with long white sleeves. All right, don't be wise in your own eyes. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be a wise guy. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. That's good advice, isn't it? Depart from evil. What should you do when you see evil? Depart. And that will be health to your flesh. How many of you won't get beat up or killed or mobbed? And it'll be strength to your bones. Honor the Lord. This is all part of trusting God. Honor the Lord with your possessions. And we said that doesn't necessarily mean uh, being generous or giving. It means being a good steward of what you do have and enjoying it. You ever had something you couldn't enjoy? (laughs) I have. I used to have a 66 Mustang, and it was beautiful. Candy apple red. 
sounded good, looked good, but it, it was so good looking, I was afraid to drive it. If it got a little ding on it or if it got dirty or, so anyway, I'm over it now. <laughs> Honor the Lord with your possessions. And then he says, and with the first fruits of all your increase. That's talking about giving. So your barns will be filled with plenty. Anybody want that? And your vats will overflow with new wine. That's the good stuff. So we said by way of, of um, review, what determines what you can have? What determines what you can have in life? Is it your job, yes or no? Is it your salary? Is it whatever the Lord wants you to have? Ooh, got quiet on that one. We tipped that sacred cow over last week, so if you weren't here, I'll kick it while it's down for you this week. It's not up to the Lord. <laughs> I know that flies in the face of, of religion, but it's what scripture teaches. Now, I'm loaded for bear. I've been hanging out with Brother Jesse. Uh, I'm telling you, you better buckle up. It's not what the Lord wants. In fact, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So what do you want? Okay, I don't have time to hang out there, but we talked about this thoroughly last week. So it's, it's not what the Lord wants, it's what you want. Well, what if I want something evil? Well, okay, we're talking about Christ followers here. We're talking about God's people here. So if you're wicked, ungodly, this doesn't apply to you. All right, this is, this is God's kids. All right, and uh, I, I like, here's a thought. I, I'll give you a challenge. You like challenges? All right, I gave you a homework assignment last week. I'm gonna be checking your paper here in a minute. But here's a challenge for you. Read through the Gospels, because Jesus is God in motion, right? And see if you can ever find a place where Jesus said no to anybody. <laughs> Just think about it. Go look. Some of you are like, oh. that'd be fun. We'll study for you. All right. So you can't leave, it, you can't leave up to God things that he's left up to you. Because guess what happens when you leave up to God things that he's left up to you? Those things go undone. Or, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Life happens. And, you know, the river, you know, just kind of takes you wherever it wants. Life takes you wherever it wants. It wants you to go. And you have to be the captain of your soul. Now, we know Jesus is, of course. These are these are things that are assumed, but we're talking about the authority and dominion that Christ has given you. I'm gonna write a book on this because people really have a hard time with this subject. And I'm, and I'm not gonna get sidetracked off into it today. I'm gonna stick with my notes because that's another sun, Sunday sermon right there. All right, so God won't leave up, uh, don't, don't leave up to God what he's left up to you. All right, so what's your vision? What do you want? What are you believing God for? Trust in him. All right, I gave you homework, remember? I said, write down everything that you would like to do or have if money were not an object. How many of you did it? All right, 12 of you, good. All right, the rest of you, I'm gonna give you an extension, a one-week extension <laughs> on your homework. If you're watching me online, you didn't do your homework, you got one more week. If you don't do it next week, I'm giving you an F. You know what that means? Nothing, <laughs> just... <laughs> because this ain't really school. But anyway, write down everything that you'd like to have or you'd like to do if money were no object. Now, discipline yourself, here's the rest of your assignment, not to start thinking or figuring out how to make it happen, just write down what you want. It's like uh, the Lord told Brother Jesse, he said, I didn't tell you to pay for it, I just told you to believe for it. Isn't that life-changing? Because when you start figuring out how you can make it happen, that's leaning on your own understanding. And if you lean on your own understanding, you're gonna fall on your face and break your nose or something, chip your tooth. That's not good. You look like you know, Bucky. So we don't, you, have you seen those bubble teeth? You know, you put the bubble teeth in. You don't wanna have, in the spirit, you don't wanna look like bubble. <laughs> so don't lean on your own understanding. 
Acknowledge him in all your ways and he'll make your path smooth, straight, and obvious. So make a vision board. I, I, I brought mine to show y'all last week. Um, I'll be, I'll be uh, adding to it um, because my vision keeps growing and expanding. So, you know, I got my morning routine. I got some morning proclamations. They, they work any time of the day. I got my, my new house there. I got my six-pack abs. I got my pile of money. I got my new Lincoln Aviator. Not the Navigator, it's too big. But I like the Aviator, it's that midsize. And it's fine, I test drove one the other day, and it's nice. I, I borrowed an Escalade to go pick up Brother Jesse, and I almost didn't bring it back. <laughs> that was pretty nice too. I'm a writer, I'm an international best-selling author as a matter of fact. Here's some actual pictures of, now I'm just giving you ideas of things you could put in your vision book. It, uh, this was, a, a, I gotta get our scuba diving cr- credentials that we went and got. Here's our ski trip, uh, some more proclamations. There's um, um, my antique truck I'm working on. There is my, my passionate marriage right there. And uh, here is, this is, you can't really see that, but it says revival. It's a bunch of people worshiping God. There's my children serving the Lord. This is Joel 2.28, God pouring out his spirit upon our sons and our daughters. There's our new church sanctuary. Can't really see that. I'll hold it up for the camera right there. Isn't that pretty? It's gonna be right out there, I think. We'll just blow out that wall and connect the new building into the old building. And so, but we gotta buy that property next door first. I think they're asking four million. We'll negotiate, but if you wanna give towards that today, M-I-L-L-I-O-N, if you're writing a check. This is our, um, uh, our new sanctuary. This is our parking garage, so that when it rains, y'all can stay dry. And everybody tells me, they say, Pastor, you don't want a parking garage, that costs too much money. And I tell them, I do want a parking garage, and it's just money. It's just money. So, so, well, what if you believe that it never happens? Time is passing anyway. You might as well believe for some stuff. Now, so, Pastor, are you materialistic? I don't think I am. But uh, you need stuff to do the will of God. It's just tools, tools. And then there's stuff that you can enjoy as well. Anyway, I'm just flipping. This is a, a watchman on the wall praying for revival. That's my, well, here's my little airplane and then here's my big airplane, and that's so that I can uh, get home to y'all on time from uh, preaching other places. Here's some of our church vans where we can pick up shut-ins and we can pick up young people that don't have wheels or old people that need a ride and, um, or homeless people and all that kind of stuff. Um, wouldn't it be cool just to totally do away with the homeless population by having them come into a life-giving fellowship like this, have them renew their mind, and then beginning to walk in abundant life. A guy asked me the other day, he says, um, hey man, I, I need some help. I said, are you sure? <laughs> he looked at me funny, I said, you might not want the kind of help I have to give, but I can help you. He said, I'm good, and he walked off. I said, okay. <laughs> So anyway, this is a big old, uh, this, is, this is an actual photograph that one of our Bible school grads took of him preaching the gospel to about a quarter million people. That's pretty cool. And y'all helped make that kind of stuff happen. Isn't that fun? This is the nation of India. You can't see, but I got seven dots on here that represent the bases that we're building. Here's my top 10 goals for 2020, my further faster year. Some more confessions of faith that I got from Pastor Chris at Wings of Life that I say on a regular basis. It's good stuff. And then I got lots of room for for other for expanded vision and i had brother jesse in here um but then he you know he's been here a couple times so now i'm gonna have to get a new picture of it was brother jesse preaching at my church now it's gonna be me and brother jesse preaching together or me me and brother jesse riding on our airplanes together racing our jets or something i don't know we'll, we'll figure it out we'll figure it out all right, so you get you a vision board. It can be a book, it can be a board, but again, the Bible says by faith and patience you inherit the promise. What's God promised you and are you believing for it? The world calls it the law of attraction. This is just what Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty two 22 and 23. This is the spirit of faith. Don't buy into all that universe stuff. It's the God of the universe. 
It's the God who made the universe. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And then he gave the earth to us, right? Okay, so do your homework. Uh, I told you, time's gonna pass. You might as well believe for some stuff. About three years ago, we started believing for our first ministry base in India. We didn't have any money for it. And long story short, three plus years down the road, we have purchased and paid for, I say we, us together, purchased and paid for three acres, built an elephant-proof wall around it, uh, built a gate in the driveway, dug two wells, built a guard shed, and now the money's come in for the, for a, the first level of our 6,400 square foot Bible school. And uh, so that's about, let's see, one, two, fifty. We're, so we've already invested about over 300,000, about $300,000 into that. Now, 300 extra thousand that I didn't have and would have never had unless we stepped out and asked God for it. And it just showed up from various and random places. In fact, I'll tell you how encouraging the Lord is. I knew this was gonna be about a $350,000 project when I started, and so I said, okay, Lord, I'm gonna ask you for it. And then, um, uh, and then about two, you ever, you ever took on a project and then had second thoughts? So about two weeks in, I was like, ooh, 350 extra thousand dollars. We already, I mean, not struggling, but it's tight. 350 extra thousand dollars. I said, Lord, I don't know. You might have to find somebody else for this project. And that week, I got a check in the mail from some missionary friends who raise all their support. They live like, I mean, they live by faith. They sent me a check for $25,000 with a note that says, hey, whatever you're doing in India, we just wanted to help. I was like, okay, Lord, I'll do it. (laughs) The Lord just encouraged me. So we took that 25,000, put it down on the three acres, and the rest just showed up. So all things are possible to who? To who? Them that believe. So if you don't believe, all things are possible to you. This is for only a certain group of folk. All things are possible to them that? Somebody say, I'm a believer. So what's possible? All things. And to whom are they possible? I <laughs> like so somebody said me. That's right. Those who believe, them who believe. Believe in who? Or in whom? What's the right way to say it, Ms. Cheryl? Believe in whom or believe in who? Who are you believing in? God. In God we trust. The Webster's Dictionary definition of the word trust means reliance on the character, ability, or strength, or truth of someone or something. How many know we can trust God's character and his reliability and his strength? One in which confidence is placed. Can you place your confidence in the Lord? To rely on the truthfulness or accuracy of. Does God tell the truth? Is he truthful? Is he accurate? Yes or no? It means to commit or place one's confidence in one's care or in one's keeping? Have you placed yourself in God's care and in his keeping and trusted yourself to him? Have you placed confidence in him? Yes or no? Do you depend on him? All right, let's go to Mark chapter 10. All right, here we go. Review is over. We're starting the new stuff. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Mark 10, 17. We're gonna go all the way through probably around verse 30. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. I think Jesus was saying, are you calling me God? (laughs) But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not uh, bear false witness, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and your mother. And he said, teacher, I obeyed all these commandments since I was a youth. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. You ever just met somebody and just liked them? He felt genuine love for him. He said, there's still one thing that you haven't done. And he told him, all right, just one thing. That's not much, it's just one thing. Here's the one thing. Go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then, everybody say then. Amen. This was the one thing that he wasn't doing. Then come and follow me. But the reason he wasn't following or putting his trust in Jesus is because of all of his possessions. 
Not that he had them, but that he knew he could get more. He had an ability. He had a talent. He had a gift. And he relied or trusted in his skill. And Jesus said, hey, I want you to stop trusting and relying in your ability, by the way, which came from God, and I want you to rely and trust in me. So Jesus wasn't asking this man to take a vow of poverty like some falsely teach. He was saying, rather, let me show you the true riches. Let me show you how to get the good stuff, and that's by following me, trusting and relying, relying upon me. I'll, I'll prove that to you if you keep reading. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now look at the next verse in verse 24. This amazed them. Why did it amaze them? Jesus said it's hard for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. This, why did it amaze them? Because they were rich. He said, what do you mean? How, they were just poor disciples? No, they were entrepreneurs. They were businessmen. They had a fishing business. If you remember on one point, Jesus said, launch out into the deep, and they cast out their nets, and they brought in so many fish that their boats began to sink, their nets began to break. They dragged it up to the shore, and then Jesus said, you think that was good? I'll teach you how to catch men. And the Bible says that they, 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 it says they left all, and they followed Jesus. Now, they didn't leave the fish on the shore to die and the boats to sink. If you keep reading, it says they left all with John's dad, Zebedee, who was their business partner, and they followed Jesus. They're like, Dad, you got this? And he's like, yeah, y'all go with him. I got this. And he sold the fish and deposited the money in the bank. I believe it was such, so much money that it enabled them to be able to follow Jesus without working for three years. So when Jesus says it's hard for rich folk to enter the kingdom of God, kingdom of God doesn't mean heaven. It means God's ways of doing things. His ways are not our ways. They are higher. How many know God's thoughts are not like our thoughts? They're what? Higher. He doesn't think like us. He's on a whole nother level. And he's trying to get you to that level, but you gotta follow him and trust and rely in him because how many know it doesn't make any sense to divest yourself? But when you're in the kingdom, how many know that seed, when planted, grow? He says, dear children, it's hard, to enter the, it's hard for, uh, for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter God's ways of doing things, enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were astounded. They're like, oh, man, mind blown. Then they said, who in the world can be saved? Because they're like, because we are loaded and they, they asked, and Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, this is impossible. But with God, come on, everybody say with God. Yeah. See, it's not a money issue, it's a trust issue. It's not if you have money, it's does money have you. Everything is possible with God. Amen. Then Peter began to speak up, duh, what's new, right? He says, we've given up everything to follow you. Jesus said, Yes, I assure you that everyone who's given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property. Notice he didn't say wives. <laughs> along with persecution. Along with persecution. Now, it isn't that people don't like money. That's not why they persecute you. They just don't like you having money or you having more than they got. That's, notice that wealthy people don't usually persecute other wealthy people. It's people that are poor in their thinking. Pastor, are you one of them blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, prosperity and health preachers? Yes, because Jesus was, the apostle Paul was. Now, I believe that there is some error in that teaching and some extremes, just like there's extremes in the teachings of God's sovereignty and, and on the other side of the coin. But I think if, you know, how many know that there's a ditch on both sides of the road? We're supposed to go right down the middle. 
keep it out of the ditches, right? Okay. And in the world to come, he says there's, there's bonus material. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. But many who are great now will be least important then, and those who seem important now will be the greatest then. See, the rich young ruler had his trust in the wrong things. He had trust issues. First, he had his trust in doing good. He'd kept all the commandments. And and then second, he had his trust in his ability to provide for himself. Now, work ethic is good and honorable, right? Can I get an amen? amen? But even that ability comes from where? God. So Jesus wasn't asking him to take a vow of poverty. He was asking him to move his trust over to God instead of his own ability to work and to create income. But pastor, money is the root of all evil. Let's read that verse. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, but those who desire to be rich, that means increased with goods. Everybody say stuff. They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's not, money's not the root of all evil, it's the love of it. I have met some poor people that have the love of money and they are drowning so it's not money it's the love of it it's what position do you give it in your life money is a magnifier it's amoral it's it's neither good nor bad it's neutral and it just makes you more of what you already are it magnifies what you already are which is why most people who win the lottery end up in worse shape afterwards than they were before They end up in more debt after they win the lottery than they were before they won the lottery. Why? Because the Bible says prosperity destroys a fool. So here's a good goal. Don't be a fool. Okay. I know we're live streaming and everything, but I'm going to tell you all something that's not in my notes and that's bonus material all right so I was talking to brother Jesse and I mean after I mean we were we were in the Escalade cruising to the jet <laughs> his jet and uh and I said as soon as we got in the, the car I said all right brother Jesse I got some crest questions he said all right hit me and when we talked like a couple of girls all the way to the airport <laughs> I asked questions he had answers and I won't tell you about the whole conversation but one thing he said as as we pulled up parked next to, the, to his jet. He's got the door open, he's got one leg out, and he, he, his, his pilot's like, come on, brother Jesse, we gotta go, and he's, he's just still talking, he wants to talk. And he, he, said, he said, Kevin, I was talking to the Lord the other day, and he said, I'm in a hurry, Jesse, I'm in a hurry. He said, so you just count on it. He said, the only thing keeping you from fulfilling the vision that God's put on your heart, it's just money. And and God is looking for people like you and me that aren't afraid. He goes, it's not about a big name. It's not about having a bunch of stuff. God's looking for people like me and you that want to get the job done. And if he can find some people like that, it's going to come so fast. You're going to have the resources to do the job, to fulfill the Great Commission. He goes, everything you want to do in India, everything you see God doing in Mobile on the Gulf Coast, it's going to happen. And it's going to, he said, you're going to call me one day and say, Brother Jesse, remember we were in escalate talking it's happening it's happening it's going to happen so fast you're going to say lord can you please slow down and he said let me tell you something i've learned about the lord he don't slow down and then he says okay call me bye <laughs> it was all it was so encouraging what's the point god is looking for people who will trust him Okay, where was I? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So they're serving God. I mean, they're serving mammon and not God. And by the way, I encourage you to sign up for one of our small groups. It's called The Blessed Life. 
It's not too late. They've already started. If you want to li- know more about this, know how to manage your money, know how to, to, to serve God and not mammon, and know how to trust in the Lord and not trust in, in, in riches, but still have riches. Get in that small group. It's on Zoom, and you can, so no matter where you are, you can dial it in, and so go to our website or go out there and, and sign up for that. So here's a thought. I just have some random thoughts I wrote down here. In heaven, you ever thought about this? In heaven, the streets are made of pure gold. I mean, how about you couldn't do that down here? You see, you see Boo and them sneaking off with a curb. <laughs> or you see, you know, Bubba over there going, right? But in heaven, how come the streets are made of pure gold? Because everybody's heart's right there. Everybody's got a pure heart there. It seems, I wrote this down. It seems that God will not give you something you want if you plan to share it with someone he is not ordained to be in your life. Let's go to Proverbs 20. Proverbs 20, the New Living Translation says, some trust in wagons and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Question, is God against horses? Is God anti-wagon? No, it's a trust issue. See, God's not against you riding in the chariot of your choice or riding on the horse of your choice. Just don't rely on it for, who, for your identity. Because what you drive is not who you are. And what you have is not a reflection of what you can do. Because you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. So God wants you to have the best as long as the best doesn't have you. Let's do a quick comparative analysis, okay? Uh, So I'm getting into the second half and last part of my message. Here's the comparative analysis. We're going to compare Moses with a king named Asa. So we're going to go to Hebrews 11, and we're going to look at Moses. I'm going to give you the quick version on Moses because I'm running out of time. But it says, by faith, verse 23, uh, Hebrews 11:23, 23. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. I mean, he he had it made, man. All he had to do was stay in the palace and continue to be a prince of Egypt. And he was loaded. And he may have even become the next pharaoh. For he looked for a different reward. Come on, there's a reward out there, y'all. Come on, somebody say, "My my reward. So by faith, he forsook Egypt. This is like the rich young ruler, if he had actually given away all of his stuff. Not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn would touch them. By faith he passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. So this is salvation and water baptism. And by faith they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. How many know when you get born again and water baptized, your past gets drowned. Moses was the prince of Egypt, and he left it all to follow God and rely or trust in God. So again, money is never the issue. Trust is always the issue. Everybody say, in God we trust. So is God trustworthy, yes or no? What are you doing to demonstrate your trust in him? What does that look like? We, have, we miss, tre- if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. And again, if you're not taking notes, I want you to write this down. We miss tremendous blessing and we bring unnecessary hardship on ourselves when we choose not to trust in the Lord. Let me say it again. We bring, or we miss tremendous blessing and bring unnecessary hardship when we choose not to trust in the Lord. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 13. Pastor, you're reading a lot of verses. I always do. Because I want you to know what the Bible says, not what PK says. 2 Chronicles 13, I'm going to give you a little um, context before we roll into Asa. I'm going to tell you about Asa's father. It says in 
2 Chronicles 13, 18. Thus the children of Israel were subdued at that time and the children of Judah prevailed because they relied or trusted on the Lord God of their fathers. So Israel was broken into two kingdoms at this time, the southern and the northern kingdom. And the southern kingdom, Judah, they trusted in God. This was the lineage of David. And Abijah pursued Jeroboam. This Abijah was the Judah godly king. He pursued Jeroboam, the ungodly king, and took cities from him, Bethel, with its villages and all these places. And then so verse 20, so Jeroboam did not recover strength again in the days of Abijah. The Lord struck him and he died. How many know when you don't trust in the Lord, not only do things not go well with you, but sometimes you get the Lord against you. And it's not that you're against the Lord. I'm gonna do like Brother Jesse. I ain't done yet, so. (laughs) Y'all ain't rushing me today. I'm gonna get finished. (laughs) So he got struck But listen to what happened to Abijah who trusted in the Lord. But Abijah grew mightily, married 14 wives, and begot 22 sons and 16 daughters. And then it says, now the rest of his acts, you mean he's got more acts than that? And all of his ways and his sayings, I guess he had some wise old sayings, they are written in the book of the prophet Iddo. You don't know where that book is, but it's, it's full, of, full of sayings. Now, listen to this. We're going to go into chapter 14. So this, that was Abijah. That was Asa's father, verse 1. Abijah rested with his fathers. He needed some rest. My goodness. And they buried him in the city of David. Now, notice Abijah, how well it went with him, but the one who didn't trust in the Lord, God struck him and he died. Then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. And in his days, the land was quiet for 10 years. And Asa, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord God. And and he removed all the altars of the foreign gods and high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. So he trusted in the Lord. We have sought the Lord our God and he has given us rest on every side. Then Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. That was a big army back then. Now, Asa went out against him, and they set troops in battle array in the valley, and and this is verse 11. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it's nothing for you to help us, whether we're many or whether they're many or whether we're few. Those uh, Those who have no power, help us, O Lord our God. For we rest on you, we trust in you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. And the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah. And the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Ger... Ger, Hard name. So the Ethiopians were overthrown. And they could not recover. I mean, that's what God will do to your enemies. Whether your enemy is sickness, whether your enemy is poverty, whether your enemy is people... They won't even be able to recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army, and Asa carried away very much spoil. How many know Asa got rich? Chapter 15, and in chapter 15, they had a revival. They started worshiping God and having a festival and and celebrating, and God moved, and the move of God ended with an offering. And it says in Asa, verse, verse 18, chapter 15, Asa brought into the house of God the things his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils, and there was no war until the 35th year of his reign. I mean, he was having a good time resting and trusting in the Lord. Impossible situations he overcame. And he came out of those impossible situations not only smelling like a rose, but loaded And then he expressed his thankfulness to the Lord. They worshiped him. They gave sacrifices and and they gave offerings of silver and gold. Now, let's look at years and years later, Asa was doing good, wasn't he? But then he backslid. Have you ever backslid? Asa, his backsliding revolved around money. Pressure and money. What do I mean by that? What money could do for him compared to what the Lord could do for him. He started thinking money could do more for him than the Lord could do for him. Somebody say, "Uh uh-oh. Asa had trust issues. 
2 Chronicles 16. In the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Basha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord. So he went to the church and got some money. And then he went to his own bank account and got some money. And he sent that money to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, let there be a treaty between you and me as there was between our daddies. See, I sent you money. Come and break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad, he said, show me the money. And so after he got the money, he heeded King Asa, and he sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they attacked uh, Ijon, Dan, Abel, Miam, or Miami, I don't know how you say that, all the storage cities of Naphtali. And it, at, now it happened when Basha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah, and they carried away the stones and the timbers of Ramah. They also took all the noodles. which Basha had used for building. And with them, he built up Geba and Mizpah. So it looked like his plan worked. He took money, he took some of God's money out of the church, he took his own money, he hired Ben-Hadad, and Ben-Hadad distracted his enemy, and while his enemy was distracted, he went over and he stole all of his enemy stuff, and he was like, yeah, man, I made out like a bandit, I got my investment back, I'm doing good, I'm so smart. You ever thought you were smart? And then, verse 7, at that time, Haniah, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, I saw something. That's what seers do. Because you have relied or trusted on the king of Syria and have not relied and trusted on the Lord, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the, Ethio were the Ethiopians not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you trusted on the Lord, God delivered them into your hand. And here's a famous verse. For the eyes of the Lord run through, to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. One, of my, one night, our men's group, we took a whole hour and we talked about this verse and how, what it means to have a heart that's loyal to the Lord and how important loyalty is. Man, it's important. It's a, it's a lost virtue. I'm gonna preach on it one day whose heart is loyal to him. In this, in other words, since you trusted in Ben-Hadad and you trusted in your money, he said, in this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you will have wars. How many of you think you're solving, you think you're solving your own problem, but you're just causing other problems down the road? That's what, that's, that's the Slippery slope of not trusting in the Lord. When you trust him, it brings great benefit. When you don't trust him, it brings unnecessary problems. Unnecessary problems. How many of you, like me, you have enough necessary problems that you don't need any unnecessary ones? Anybody online watching today, you can wave a hanky and say, yes, that's me. Type it down in the comments. Don't need no extra. Ain't nobody got time for that. That's what you can type. So trust in the Lord. Then Asa was angry with the preacher, the seer, and he put him in prison. Some of always get mad at the preacher. For he was enraged at him because of his prophecy. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not trust in the Lord, but trusted in the physicians. Now, it's okay to go to the doctor as long as you're trusted in the Lord. So Asa died in the 41st year of his reign. Man, he started off so good. Guess what? It's not how you start it. It's how you what? It's how you finish. You might not have started trusting in the Lord, but you can end trusting in the Lord. Amen? So I got one last verse for you today. 1 Timothy 6, 17. We were over there a minute ago. And this says, instructions to the rich. That's what the Bible calls this phrase, instructions to the rich. Everybody say, that's me. Okay? Now, if you didn't say, that's me, then just say, oh, my. <laughs> Some of you don't know what to say. <clears throat> 
Did you know that it's God's will for you to be saved and go to heaven? Did you know, you believe that? You believe God, it's God's will for you to be sick, and, uh, uh, sick or to be well? To be well. He wants you to be healthy, right? Jesus took stripes on his back so that you could be healed. Did you know that it's God's will for you not to be confused but to, for to, but to know the will of God? you believe that? Say yes. Did you know that it's God's will for you to have and walk in an abundant life and be blessed and be rich? Okay. I was just checking. Make sure I was in the right church. So this is instructions to the rich. Everybody who believes it say, that's me. Okay. He says, this is, he says, Pastor Timothy, command those who are rich in this present age. Now, now let me just stop here. Let me look at this camera over here because this is one problem that modern day preachers have is they don't have the guts to command rich people. Ooh, it got quiet in this Presbyterian church. You don't want to make rich people mad because they might leave and stop or stop giving. Or, the Bible says, command those who are rich. So this morning, I'm commanding you. You might think, yeah, but I'm not rich. That's not what the Bible says. He, Jesus, became poor that you might be made rich. 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 That that, that word's in the Bible. I'm not talking about winning the lottery. How many wealth starts right here? If you're poor, then... Let me tell you one of my chapter titles in in a book I'm writing. Poverty is a mental illness. If you're poor, it's because you think poor. I don't have time to get into that, but I'm going to command those that are rich today. And if you live in America compared to the rest of the world, you are rich. You don't believe it? Come to India with me. I've been to Ethiopia. Come to Ethiopia with me. You are rich. Even if you stand in the cheese line, you're rich. Even if you're on government subsidies, you are rich, comparatively speaking. But I want you to know that there are no food stamps in heaven. That is not the kingdom way, and God wants to elevate you up out of poverty so that you can be a blessing to other people. It's God's will for you to be blessed and to be a blessing. Everybody say, I'm a blessing. Going somewhere to happen. Come on, say it with me. Say, I am blessed to be a blessing. Say, I'm a blessing going somewhere to happen. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty or prideful or arrogant, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Proverbs says, money makes, a, makes wings for itself and it flies away. You ever experienced that? I have. Don't trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Are you enjoying yourself today? So here's my altar call. Do you have trust issues today? What have you been trusting in instead of the Lord? Have you been trusting in someone else? Maybe they've let you down. If they haven't, they will because they're human. Or maybe you've been trusting in yourself. By God, I ain't trusting. I'm going to rely on nobody. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. And just remember who gave you your bootstraps. Those came from the Lord too. Are you trusting in money? I've got so much. I got more money than God. Do you? I got so much money, I'll never be able to spend it. Is that right? Are you trusting in your own abilities? Your own skill. I had to examine my heart before I preached this message. I said, Lord, what what am I trusting in instead of you? And he said, your ability, your speaking ability. I'm like, ooh. Because I've I've had to get up and speak before, and I thought, well, I didn't have time to prepare, but I got this. I've been doing this for so long, so trusted in my experience. Ooh, the Lord says, stop trusting in your experience, stop trusting in your ability, and trust in me. Even if it's something you're good at, trust in him. What have you been trusting in? So I had to repent of that. Just in the last 24 hours. Did you know I repent on a regular basis? Did y'all know that? I repent all the time. You know why? Because the Lord convicts me all the time. And the Bible says, those, those whom he loves, he corrects. So I, the Lord must be head over heels in love with me. 
He corrects me all the time, man. But, I'll, but hey, you know when you need to get worried? When he stops correcting you. You know what the judgment of God is? It's not when he takes a lightning bolt and whoop, bam. That's not the judgment of God. It's not when he strikes you with his hand. It's when he takes his hand and he lifts it off of you and says, okay, Frank Sinatra, have it your way. They don't sing that song. There's only one person singing, I did it my way in heaven as Jehovah sitting on the throne. Everybody's singing that down in hell. <laughs> have you trusted him for your salvation? Have you trusted him with your soul? Would you bow your heads today? Just want you to take a moment and ask the Lord, Lord, where, am I, where have I been, where have I put my trust where I should have put it in you. Show me where I've been trusting, where I should be trusting in you. And ask him to forgive you. Confess it to him. But he already knows, confess it to him. Confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you're watching us online today, Right where you are watching this today, ask the Lord, where have I been putting my trust where I should be trusting in you? Have I been putting my trust in uncertain riches? Have I been putting my trust in people, in myself, in my own abilities, in my portfolio, in my stuff, in my, my estate, in other relationships? What have you been trusting? Your own cleverness. Just ask him, Lord, show me. Anywhere I've been trusting where I should only be trusting in you. Show me, Lord. Convict me, Lord. And then would you just ask him to forgive you? And then, and then make a confession of faith to him. Just say, Lord, I, in that area, I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. If you're here today and you've never entrusted your heart, your soul, your salvation to the Lord, if you've been trusting in what a good person you are, or if you've been trusting in how well you behave, how moral you are, I want you to know that you're trusting in faulty things. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Would you, would you acknowledge him today in all your ways? Come on, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or if you're not right with God today, would you just pray this prayer with me right now? Say, dear God in heaven, I trust in you. I repent of my sin. I believe that you died in my place. And on the third day, God raised Jesus from the dead. And I say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I trust in you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. Welcome to the kingdom, amen. Did you get anything out of this today? I know we covered a lot of territory, a lot of scripture, but here's the punchline. Trust in the Lord. <laughs> in God we trust. Don't have trust issues. Trust in the Lord, because he is trustworthy, isn't he? And he's never lost a battle. Amen. Praise God.